Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. Hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome to Perimeter Institute. Welcome to our public lecture series here in the Mike Lazaridis Theater of Ideas. My name is Greg Dick. I'm the director of educational outreach here at Perimeter, and it is an honor to welcome all of you here for this very special occasion. Those of you here in the theater and those of you watching online. Now this season, I'm pleased to announce that BMO for Women is, supporting, is a supporting partner of our public lecture series, supporting lectures that have female speakers. So thank you, and let's a round of applause for BMO. Thank you. And now, to make the special introductions of our very special guest speaker, I'm going to call on the director of Perimeter Institute, Dr. Neil Turok. Neil? Thank you, Greg, and a very warm hello to all of you who've joined us on this really special occasion. Um, we have an uh, amazing full house here at Perimeter, and of course, many people around the world online. We're absolutely thrilled to have Jocelyn Bell Burnell as tonight's, tonight's guest lecturer, a great scientist and a wonderful person. She has served in many prominent roles as president of the Institute of Physics, of the Royal Astronomical Society, and of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And she's won many awards. This year, she was awarded one of the biggest cash prizes in science, the Special Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics, for, for her discovery of pulsars in 1967. And characteristically, she has donated the entire award to support physics PhD studentships for people from underrepresented groups. It is a great pleasure to be able to celebrate that award with her tonight. Before I welcome Jocelyn to the stage, I want to acknowledge another very special individual with us here tonight. The co-recipient of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics, Donna Strickland of the University of Waterloo. fortunate we are to have these two extraordinary women with us tonight. Donna and Jocelyn, we have a little surprise for you. Over the past year, Perimeter has celebrated pioneering women of physics by creating a series of free posters called Forces of Nature, which both of you are. These posters are already hanging in classrooms and homes around the world. To commemorate the incredible things you two have done, we've included you among the forces of nature. <laughs> I should emphasize these posters are all free to download from insidetheperimeter.ca. Now, it is my great pleasure and honor to give the stage to Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who will share with you her incredible story. Thank you very much. So thank you to all of you for this wonderful welcome. Thank you to Perimeter for the opportunity to visit. And thank you also to BMO for funding women in science. I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about the stars that I discovered when I was a grad student. It is 50 years ago. I suspect the memory has been sanitized slightly in the, in the interim. Uh, but I hope you still find it a good story. So I'm going to say a little bit about what radio astronomy is. I will have to say a little bit about quasars, because that's what I was meant to be doing. Um, I'm going to say a bit about being in Cambridge, United Kingdom, and the discovery of pulsars, and then also a bit about what pulsars are. 
I'm starting with material that maybe you all know. I'm going to just remind you about the family of light. Technical name, the electromagnetic spectrum. You will have seen a rainbow, I'm sure, with the light colors split up into its different wavelengths. It's right in the center of this diagram. There's a lot of other radiations that are of the same family of li as light, which our eyes don't see, like all of this and all to the left. So we are a bit limited, actually. There's a lot else that we might have been able to see had our eyes been different, but we can't. You'll have heard of some of these. If we come out the violet end of the spectrum, we come to ultraviolet. Ultraviolet disco lamps, luminescent fluorescence, things like that. Um, it's also ultraviolet in sunlight that causes sunburn. Go beyond the ultraviolet, we come to x-rays. It's alarming how many of us have had x-rays, but the x-rays that we've had have been generated by human beings. Stars and galaxies also naturally generate x-rays, and astronomers study those. And beyond x-rays are gamma rays, Gamma rays sometimes used in cancer treatments, for sterilizing food, for sterilizing hospital instruments. And if we go out the other way from the little rainbow we can see, we come to infrared, beyond the red, as in infrared lamps, infrared heaters, coming on into what some people would define as radio, millimeter wave stuff, radar, microwave ovens, microwave links, in through the television band to the radio bands. And stars and galaxies we now know radiate right across this spectrum. Not all of them across all of it, but at each bit you can pick up various stars and galaxies. This is a photograph of the iconic British radio telescope at Jodrell Bank. Photograph taken near sunset, as you can see by the nice red sun. The telescope is looking up to the top left. The dish collects the radio waves, focuses them up here, where there is a detector to pick up the radio waves, and then there's a cable will come all the way down and into the laboratory in the building where there'll be recording equipment. We don't usually listen to radio telescopes because we need some kind of hard record. So it comes out on paper charts, if you're as old as I am, or computer records these days. Radio astronomy was developed following World War II. A number of people had worked in radar, developing radar as a wartime instrument. And at the end of the war, those people quite often, at least in this country and in the UK, managed to acquire some of the radio radar equipment, take them back to their universities and start radio astronomy observing. So they no longer transmitted the way radar did, just received. And in Britain, actually, we had a number of German radar dishes which were requisitioned. Uh, the people who worked on radar were inevitably known as boffins. And unfortunately, the name stuck for quite a long time. But when people turned these radio receiving dishes to the sky, they found a wealth of radio emitting things up there amongst the stars and galaxies. And uh, a lot of excitement and a lot of interest in ascertaining what exactly they were. One of the big puzzles was some of the brightest of those sources. Things that have become quasars because they looked quasi-stellar like stars, but not properly stars. They were a big puzzle for quite a while, and then in 1963, Martin Schmidt, a Dutchman working in the United States, finally cracked it. The spectrum, the optical spectrum that they were picking up for these quasars, was, could be explained if you gave it an enormous shift to the red end of the spectrum, which in turn implied these things were very, very distant. 
So how can they be so very bright if they're very, very distant? Well, actually, both statements are true. They were very, very bright in radio waves, and they are very, very distant. So quasars rapidly became a very intriguing topic. A couple of years later, I moved into radio astronomy, having done my first degree, and the quasars were a very hot topic. Slight digression to explain the next little bit. Uh, you've probably already noticed my funny accent. Uh, map of the British Isles. I started life in Northern Ireland. I went and had a lot of my secondary education in York. And I went and did my bachelor's degree in Scotland in the University of Glasgow. And then rather to my surprise, I found myself in the deep south in Cambridge. Well, you can find all that on a regular map, but you won't find that. <laughs> of course, Canada being a properly egalitarian country doesn't have anything like this, does it? So <laughs> but when I turned up here, I really felt like some freak from outer space or somewhere like that. They were all terribly confident terribly bright, quite keen to let you know it, <laughs> and uh, I kind of quailed. We now have a name for this. I wonder how many people in this room have heard of imposter syndrome? A few, right, that's helpful, good. Um, imposter syndrome is when somebody from the sticks turns up at a posh place, it might be to study, it might be a new job, and they suddenly realize, ooh, her. ooh, they're all very clever here, I'm not. They've made a mistake admitting me, they're going to discover their mistake and they're going to throw me out. And in a bad case, um, and I'm at University of Oxford and you know, we sometimes get this, in a bad case, the student will say, I'd better leave before they throw me out and they're gone after a week of term. And it's quite contagious. They sometimes take one or two others with them. I recognize now that I was suffering from imposter syndrome. I came from this north and west, uncouth part of the country, turned up in this very suave Cambridge. And I thought, ah, uh -uh, they're all terribly bright here. Uh -huh, they've made a mistake, they're going to discover their mistake. But I'm a bit of a fighter, so I said, I will work my very hardest until they throw me out. <laughs> so that when they throw me out, I won't have a guilty conscience. I'll know I've done my best and I just wasn't bright enough for Cambridge. Zeldovich. One of the new fellowships here is named after Zeldovich. This wonderful quote, I don't think it was said of Cambridge, but it could be. Fre <laughs> Frequently in error, but never in doubt. <laughs> I'm told he said it of cosmologists, but of course there aren't any of them here, are there? <laughs> My discomfort increased slightly when First day of this formal PhD program, the graduate students in radio astronomy got given each a set of tools. <laughs> well, that's not quite true. There were some funny characters called theoreticians. They didn't get given a set of tools, but the rest of us did. And these are not microelectronics tools. These are heavy duty wire working tools. And I still have mine and this is them. I was to spend the next two years helping build a radio telescope, a homemade radio telescope at the Radio Astronomy Observatory a few miles outside Cambridge. I was given responsibility for all the plugs and connectors. I was spared quite a bit of the sledgehammering, but by the end of my PhD, I could swing one of those sledgehammers. Not the sort of skill you normally expect to get during a PhD. <laughs> the, 
This is near the end of the project and shows you the kind of working conditions we have. Uh, the technician who worked with me, Don, and myself. We have some very expensive, low-loss cable. Uh, you can't coil it up and take it indoors. So to put the plugs on the two ends, I was provided with some little shelters. And I sat inside these little huts and put the plugs on each end of the cable. And here we're checking the impedance using a slotted waveguide. What you don't see is that it's about 300, 400 meters to the nearest power socket. It's literally working in the field. Uh, and one of the things I discovered is it's very hard to solder in the field because the wind cools the soldering iron. It's uh, some complications. The telescope was a huge area, covered the equivalent of 57 tennis courts. It was fairly cheap as things went in those days. And as I say, there was a group of us spent two years building it. This is the finished product. It looks like a homemade radio telescope. It was a homemade radio telescope. Um, there's over 2,000 antennae there. Uh, maybe some of you will recognize the nice bluey green of oxidized copper. Several tons of copper in it, all in the form of wire and about 190 kilometers of wire and cable in total. Uh, for those who want slight, something slightly more technical, uh, it worked at a wavelength of 81.5 megahertz. That's a big wavelength, three, three and a half meters. Uh, 2,000 odd dipoles, over 1,000 wooden posts. They're really important because you've got to keep all this stuff out of the wet grass. Wet grass is an electrical short. So if you don't have all your stuff well clear of the wet grass, your signal runs to ground. As a student in Glasgow, I had used transistors as part of my final year project. I was slightly surprised when I turned up in Cambridge to find they used valves still. So I said, why don't you use transistors? Whoa, noisy things. Whoa, unreliable. We use valves. <laughs> they ultimately changed, but they were pretty cautious. Now, my job was to find more quasars. And my thesis advisor, Tony Hewish, had recognized that there was a very neat way to do this. So I'll now try and explain this phenomenon. It's called interplanetary scintillation. Scintillation means twinkling, and interplanetary means between the sun and the planets within the solar system. So we have a quasar. Um, I've marked it on my graph as here, but actually it's way, way up at the ceiling, a long, long way away. And the radio waves from the quasar come down towards the radio telescope here on the Earth. And to get from there to us, they have to come through the space between the sun and the planets. And that space is not empty. There's a wind blowing out of the sun, an ionized wind. And that ionized wind is not perfectly smooth. There are some clumps or clouds in it with slightly greater electron density. And these clumps or clouds cause the radio wave from a compact object to be spread out. And because this ionized medium is blowing out from the sun, with the solar wind, these clouds, so to speak, blow past. And what an uh, observer sees is a fluctuating signal from the distant quasar. Uh, you may not be able to read it, but that bar is a time scale of about one second. Ordinary radio sources, which aren't quasars, are much broader. Remember that quasar is quasi-stellar so it's pretty compact. A broader radio source, you see through several of these clumps at any one time. And so the clumps blowing past, there's minimal change in brightness. But a compact object will show quite extreme changes in brightness. So, my thesis advisor, Tony, argued, all we need to do is to survey the sky and look for objects that fluctuate in brightness like this, and those are the quasars. And that was the project. 
but first you had to build your radio telescope. An analogy, it's not perfect analogy, so apologies to the physicist. This is a picture of ripples on the floor of a swimming pool. And as the wind blows, this pattern of light and dark moves across. So if you imagine yourself lying briefly on the floor of the swimming pool and looking up, you see these bright and dark things go by. And it's a bit like the twinkling we observed for the compact quasars. I've probably said most of this. The one thing I need to stress is if you're going to see this rapid fluctuation, you need to be taking short exposures. You need to have a short time constant, a short integration time. And we use one of a tenth of a second. Spent the first two years building the telescope. And at the end of those two years when it was finished, the rest of the group that had been involved in construction moved on to other projects. And I was left to get the telescope working, debug it, and use it for about six months. So I did that, and I found about 180 more quasars, taking the number of known quasars from 20 to 200. So we had a good sample at the end of it. And in fact, my thesis had to be on that, because Tony said it was too late to change the title. <laughs> yeah. I put the pulsars in an appendix, and it's probably the most read appendix of anybody's thesis. <laughs> All right. So, University of Cambridge at that time had one computer. It had memory less than your laptop, and it took up a very big room. It was full of valves. Very few academics got time on that little computer. Uh, Martin Ryle, who headed the group, did because he was making maps of the radio sky using Fourier techniques and doing Fourier inversion by hand is quite hard work. So he had time. Every other academic in radio astronomy had grad students instead of access to the computer. <laughs> and our data came out on long rolls of paper chart, and this is a piece of it. We got 30 meters every day of this paper chart, it took us four days to complete the scan of the sky. So one sky scan was 120 meters of chart. And I operated the telescope for six months, accumulating over five kilometers of chart paper. And I can assure you I've looked at every fraction of a centimeter of that, and some of it twice over. Got used to identifying quasars. Got used to identifying human-produced interference. These days, radio interference would be mobile phones, maybe microwave ovens, aircraft altimeters. In those days, it was badly suppressed stars, sparking thermostats, sparking power lines, things like that. And because we have this enormous radio telescope, it picks up interference really, really well. This is a sample, carefully selected, of the chart. Uh, it's a stretch about, it's about real, well, on this screen, it's about real size. And uh, in Tony's handwriting, he's identified the first sighting of a pulsar and some low-level interference. So this is a distant, badly suppressed car or sparking thermostat. And people near the front can probably see that the two look slightly different. This one, the spikes go up and down, and you can see chart paper between the spikes. On this one, the spikes go largely upwards, and there are places where they're really packed solid. If we have any students in the audience, what you're doing when you make that kind of comparison is a kind of Fourier analysis. You're commenting on the amplitudes of the waves that make up these signals, and you're commenting on the frequencies. You know, here we can see space between the spikes, low frequency. Here we can't. I did a physics degree, and I'd argue that maybe anybody who's done a physics degree will have had this, the same experience that I'm about to describe. 
unless they're terribly bright because it involves bits of physics that you're meant to be learning as a student that you don't properly understand yet. And so when you have an exam, you have to learn it off parrot fashion. And there were bits of physics, not too many, but there were some bits of physics that as an undergraduate, I had to learn parrot fashion. And those bits of physics really bugged me. I kept saying to myself, I must find the time and go back to sort that out. The problems that I didn't understand lodged in my brain. I think the same thing happened here. At some subconscious level, this bit of signal that I couldn't explain, even though it's only about five millimeters long, it lodged in the back of my brain, unknown to me. But after it come a few times, my brain said, you've seen something like this before, haven't you? You've seen it from this bit of sky, haven't you? And then it's easy. We survey the sky in strips. Well, we point the telescope at one level and we let the Earth turn it. So we get a strip of sky and another strip of sky and another strip of sky. And I keep these rolls of chart paper filed in shoe boxes, labeled with the strip of sky. So having suspected that I've seen this before, this was declination 23 beam, I go find the box that says declination 23, pull out, get the charts out, spread them out. You need lots of floor when you've got this amount of chart paper, and line up the different charts so they're all properly lined up. So. Here's this one. Wasn't there that time, didn't see it that time, didn't show that time. Oh, it might have been there. It's a bit faint, but it might have been there. No, no. Yeah, that's one of the ones I logged before with a question mark. And so is that one. And you know, they all line up. They're keeping their place amongst the stars. They've got the same right ascension is the technical term. Now, you probably have noticed that there are different constellations in the night sky and in the daytime sky. Sorry, in the summertime sky. <laughs> you don't see many constellations in the daytime sky. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason you've got different constellations in the winter and summer skies is because the stars do not go round in 24 hours. The stars go round in 23 hours, 56 minutes. And that four minute difference accumulates and makes a difference. This thing is keeping the 23 hour, 56 minute time. Whatever it is, it's moving round with the stars. But it's very hard to tell what it is because it's all jammed into five millimeters. So I showed these recordings to Tony and said, what do you think this is and what do we do about it? And Tony rightly observed, well, it's all jammed into five millimeters and you can't really see what's happening. We need an enlargement. And with chart recordings, enlargements are easier, easy. You just run the paper faster underneath the pen and everything gets spread out. So, okay, we just switch the pen recorders to high speed. Mm -mm. The pen recorder runs out of paper after 20 minutes. <laughs> and guess who has to live at the observatory day and night putting a fresh roll of paper in every 20 minutes? <laughs> Not a good idea. Next best idea, the graduate student goes out to the observatory at this time, switches to the high speed recording, lets it run at high speed till about this time, and switches back to normal. And I did that religiously for a month. And I made high-speed recordings of this stuff, which is <laughs> ambient receiver noise. And it wasn't that I'd got the time wrong. The thing had disappeared. It had gone. And Tony was livid. <laughs> oh, it's a flare star. It's been and gone and done it, and you've missed it. If you haven't experience being a grad student, you need to know that grad students serve the same purpose as the cat. 
there for kicking when things get bad. <laughs> Finally, one day, I said, sod this, I'm skipping going out. By this stage, the thing was transiting at lunchtime. It was a very interesting lecture in Cambridge I wanted to go to. I remember it vividly because of the circumstances and because it was on aging. Gets more relevant. <laughs> Next morning, I went out to the observatory. It had reappeared after a month's absence, and I'd missed it. <laughs> I didn't dare leave. I stayed out at the observatory. Um, fingers hard crossed that after a month's absence, it would show two days in a row. And this is the recording I got. The bottom trace is man-made, human-made, one-second time pips, which were broadcast in Britain and we put on our records. The upper trace is the signal that came in. And you can see a faint hint of pulses at the left-hand end. Bump, 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 one missing. Bump, 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 several missing, back on cue. So even where the pulses went missing, it kept the beat didn't miss a beat. Well, it missed a beat, but it didn't lose the beat. And the period is about one and a third seconds. Well, I'd seen nothing like that before. I decided I would break with convention and phone my thesis advisor. <laughs> he was probably, well, he was teaching in an undergraduate laboratory, probably dealing with some twit of an undergraduate who thinks his diffraction grating has one line per inch. And his twit of a grad student phones up, says, Tony, you know that funny thing? It's a pulse signal one and a third seconds apart. Oh, well, that settles it. It's man-made. <laughs> I didn't think it was, but I couldn't marshal the argument quickly enough. <coughs> but the argument I should have marshaled is, on and off, I've been watching this thing now for several months and it keeps a 23-hour, 56-minute day. It moves with the stars. Human beings keep a 24-hour day. So if it's Joe Bloggs driving down the road in a badly suppressed car after work, he's getting off work four minutes earlier each day, 28 minutes. <laughs> Tony was interested enough to come out to the observatory next day at the transit time and stand looking over my shoulder. And that was one of the really scary bits of my PhD. <laughs> this thing's been missing for a month. It was there the day I missed it. It was there yesterday. Will it be there a third day in a row? It was. He saw it with his own eyes. And he established that the spacing of the pulses was the same as on the previous day but he was still hung up on it's man-made, it's artificial. However, he took away all my records and finally convinced himself that it wasn't local radio interference, that it was moving with the stars. It kept sidereal time. So the next thing is, well, Jocelyn's wired up the radio telescope wrong. <laughs> so, the obvious thing to do is to get another radio telescope to observe it. And we did have on site another radio telescope working at the same frequency. Uh, and we spoke to the people using it, Paul and his grad student, Robin, and said, you know, let them in on what was going on. I said, you know, would you mind seeing if you can see it? And so a few days later, we all congregated out at the observatory. Uh, the thing appeared first in my telescope beam, and we could see it was pulsing nicely. And then we went and stood by Robin's chart recorders, because he too worked with chart recorders. And we stood there, and nothing happened. We calculated it would appear in that telescope's beam about five minutes later, and it didn't. Tony and Paul started walking down this long laboratory saying, now what could it be that shows in ours and not yours? Could it be? No, it can't be, but I wonder if, no, that wouldn't work. Hmm, you think? No, hmm, no. And I was padding along behind them, and Robin stayed by his pen recorder, 
We got down this long, long laboratory and suddenly there was a shriek, here it is! And we came charging back up again. So another radio telescope with its own receiver also picks it up. But of course, they're both on the same site. They're only a few hundred yards apart. So if there's some funny local interference, they're both going to be equally affected. Meanwhile, we had looked quite carefully at these pulses, and we'd observed that the pulses are short, which means the thing has to be small. But we'd been observing it probably for about a week or 10 days by then, and it was keeping the same period. So it wasn't getting tired. So it's got large energy reserves. So it's big. It's small and it's big. Yippee. You have to sharpen up the questions or the statements slightly. Yep, it's got short pulses or steep pulses, which means it's small. It keeps an accurate pulse period, which means it's got a lot of energy reserves. It's big in the sense of being massive. So it's massive and small. We still couldn't think what that was, but with hindsight, of course, it's abundantly clear. A colleague managed to get a measurement that allowed us to estimate the distance. When a radio signal propagates through space, it gets dispersed, and higher frequencies arrive a little bit before lower frequencies. This is the radio equivalent of a rainbow. And my colleague took two receivers, tuned them to slightly different frequencies, found that the pulse appeared first in the high frequency, blip, 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 blip. And the spacing between blip and blip gives you an estimate of the distance. And he estimated it was about 200 light years away, which puts it beyond the sun and the planets, but way out in our galaxy, not beyond the galaxy. Tony wondered if it really was little green men, aliens signaling to us. And he argued that if it was aliens, they probably lived on a planet which went round their sun. Now, for a moment, pretend you're the observers and I'm a little green person on a planet orbiting my sun. And I'm sending out pulses. And as I walk towards you, the pulses pile up on each other a bit, the spacing between them smaller. And as I walk away from you, the spacing between them is larger. This is what we call Doppler shift. Uh, you've probably come across Doppler shift. Have you ever seen a child go, meow? <laughs> that change in pitch, meow, mm, is Doppler shift. Higher when it's coming towards you, lower when it's going away from you. Same thing here with little green men. So I continued making these observations to look for Doppler shifts. And couldn't find, well, no, it's not true to say we couldn't find any. We found a Doppler shift. But actually, there's a Doppler shift because the Earth is moving around the sun. Because that moves the telescope, or moves the telescope away. So we proved that the Earth went round the Sun, but otherwise weren't, <laughs> weren't making a lot of progress. One evening, about three weeks into this story, just before Christmas, I went down to Tony's office to ask him something, and rather unusually, the door was shut. So I knocked, and Tony said, come in. Put my head round the door. Ah, Jocelyn, come in and shut the door. So I went in and shut the door. And there was a discussion going on. There was the Martin Ryle, who was the head of the group, the professor. There was Tony, my thesis advisor. And there was another senior radio astronomer who was an editor of one of the journals. And it was a conversation that I think I should have been part of right from the beginning. How do we publish this? We've only got one. It looks absolutely crazy. We've done just about all the tests we can think of. We really ought to publish it and tell the rest of the world. But we'll, we'll never get it accepted if there's only one crazy thing. We didn't solve it that evening. 
I went back from some, for some supper really rather cross. Why do some little green men have to choose my frequency and my radio telescope to signal to Earth? I had only a few months' money left on my thesis grant, so it was getting serious. Came back in after supper to do some chart analysis. Um, the laboratory got locked at 10 o'clock at night. Grad students did not have keys. You could be locked in for the night or locked out for the night. And doing some of this routine chart analysis from a totally different strip of sky, there was a, a patch that was really barely usable. It was a, a problem with a very, very strong radio source low on the northern horizon. And our telescope could see it through the back of the telescope. It was such a strong source. And it really messed up the records. And I got quite used to just abandoning, what, about 20 inches of chart recording. And I got to that bit at about 5 to 10, suddenly so in the middle. Ooh, that looks like... Wow, right. Yes, OK. Um, out comes the box that covers this strip of sky. Throw out the charts on the floor, roughly line them up. So here's tonight where I think I've seen it. No, no. It might be in there. It's very weak. No, no, no. Ah, I missed that. Oh, and there's another. And they all line up. And that bit of sky is going to be seen by the telescope at 2 o'clock in the morning. I've got to be there. And the janitor's locking up, throw the charts on the desk and run out with the janitor locking the doors behind me. <laughs> Go out to the observatory at 2 o'clock in the morning. It's the 21st of December. It gets quite cold in Cambridge. Not perhaps as cold as it gets here on the 21st of December, but pretty cold. And something in the telescope didn't like cold weather. And it wasn't functioning properly. So I swore at it. I flicked switches. I breathed on it. I got it to work for five minutes at full strength. It was the right five minutes and the right beam setting looking at the right bit of sky. And in came pulse, 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 pulse. This time one and a quarter seconds apart. The first was one and a third. But otherwise, the same kind of thing. Fantastic. I somehow got a message to Tony and I went off to Ireland. My boyfriend came with me and we announced our engagement. And Tony kept the survey running over the Christmas holidays, which means he put paper in the chart recorders, ink in the ink wells, and piled the charts unanalyzed on my desk. <laughs> I came back after Christmas, sporting this engagement ring. It was really daft. I should not have worn it into the lab. In those days, married women quit work. It was considered shameful if a married woman had to work. It meant he couldn't earn enough to keep them both. But I was terribly proud of that ring. So Tony's in a meeting. It's quite clear what I have to do. I sit down to do some chart analysis, merrily working along. Oh, which one's that? It's not either? Wow. OK, I'll just finish this piece of chart, and then I'll come back and you know address this. So move on. What? Two? About a meter apart on the same piece of chart? At that point, Tony appears and stands at the end of the desk. Hey, Tony! Tony, look! Oh, Happy New Year, Tony! Thank you for keeping the survey running. Look at this! Huh. How many more have you missed? Go back through all your old records. <laughs> I did. We didn't find any more candidates, and over the next couple of weeks, we confirmed the third and the fourth. And that's good. That's great. We can now publish. So we pushed ahead, we published the first one, and a paper on the second, third, and fourth, shortly following behind. Um, just a little story for the benefit of those in the audience who know who Fred Hoyle was, is. Shortly before the paper announcing the first one was published, Tony gave a colloquium in Cambridge, gave it a very titillating title, and everybody came. 
We'd been fairly cautious about shouting about this because we were really, really worried that it was something with a mundane explanation and we'd look very stupid. So it hadn't become broadly known. Tony did his colloquium. Fred Hoyle was sitting in the front row. And at the end of Tony's speech, Fred said, and I'll imitate his Yorkshire accent, this is the first I've heard of these things. And we weren't surprised because we'd been fairly careful with what we said. This is the first I've heard of these things. I don't think it's a white dwarf, which was Tony's favorite model. I think it's a supernova remnant. <laughs> supernova are stars that explode and the core of the star gets very compressed and becomes known as a neutron star. And we hadn't seriously, very seriously considered neutron stars because Tony liked the white dwarf model. Fred, starting from cold, in 45 minutes has hit the right explanation. That man was a fantastic physicist. Really very impressive. There was lots of publicity around it. Um, typical interview would be Tony and I, and the journalist or the TV or whoever it was, would ask Tony about the astrophysical significance of this discovery, which Tony truly gave them. And they then turned to me for what they called the human interest. <laughs> How tall was I? How many boyfriends did I have? Would I describe my hair as brunette or blonde? No other colors were allowed. And what were my vital statistics? It was nasty. It was horrible. You were a piece of meat. Photographers would say, could I undo some buttons, please? Oh, it was awful. I would have loved to have been very, very rude to them, but I reckoned I'm a grad student. I've uh, not finished my data analysis. I've not written my thesis. I've not got a job. I need references. You're quite vulnerable. So, however, one nice thing was the Daily Telegraph, which is a rather right wing, but otherwise respectable newspaper in Britain, <laughs> um, pro-Brexit. It's um, a... <laughs> Its science correspondent, Antti Michaelis, interviewed us and said, what are you going to call these things? We'd had a serious discussion about whether in the paper we described them as pulsed radio sources or pulsating radio sources, and opted for pulsating as pulsed might imply an agency, little green men, making it pulsed. But we hadn't thought of a short name. And it was Anthony Michaelis who came up with the name Pulsar, by analogy with Quasar, which we already have. And these days, as you know, the name has traveled. Um, there's watches called Pulsars. Um, certainly in the UK, there's models of Nissan cars called Pulsars. You can sometimes find geraniums called Pulsars. Um, same name. I'm told that in the United States, the watch company tried suing the radio astronomers for use of the name. <laughs> so we're going to get serious now. What are these pulsars, other than that they're small and they're massive? We'll start with the video, because that's probably already catching your eye. Very small star spinning about an axis that's vertical in this configuration, and two beams coming out of it. They actually come out from the magnetic poles as opposed to the rotational poles. And if the beam shines in your eye like now, you see a pulse. The other beam misses you, you don't see a pulse. You see the first one again. More static model on the right-hand side. Doesn't actually add a lot, but it shows you more of the magnetic field lines. 
Uh, we still don't fully, well, a lot of us still don't fully understand how the radio beam is made, but it does seem to come from the region above the magnetic poles. They're very small, very dense, neutron-rich, but not pure neutron objects. So they're also called neutron stars, with very strong gravitational fields, very strong electrical and magnetic fields, and rapidly spinning. And I'll unpack all of this in a moment. They're probably formed in the explosion that occurs at the end of the life of a massive star, things at about 10 times the mass of the sun. They were the core of the star, and in the explosion, they got kicked against and compressed. And the main way we see them is as these pulsed radio-emitting objects. If you did what radio astronomers never do, and that's listen to what the radio telescope's picking up, it might sound like this. So these objects are seen primarily in the radio, rarely in the visible, sometimes in X-rays and gamma rays. And we've now got around about 3,000, or pushing 3,000 of them. Um, a few in the visible, about 100 in X-ray, and a surprisingly large number at the high energy gamma rays. Most of them are isolated. Some of them are twinned with another star. One of them is a pair of pulsars and is fantastically useful. Um, they're, they're closely spaced pulsars. They go around very fast. Really, really good for checking out Einstein's theories of relativity. Uh, sorry, Einstein's theories of gravitation. And Einstein's theories of gravitation check out very nicely, which is interesting. One is in a triple system. That's being used to check out Einstein's principle of equivalence in the strong field. Do objects of different composition fall in the same way under gravity? Uh, we haven't got a result on that one yet. There's got to be, the answer's pretty close, whichever way it is, and they've got to pay a lot of attention to the errors and the systematics. So there isn't really an answer on that one yet. And there are a few with planets. And I can give you several good reasons why a pulsar shouldn't have planets, or shouldn't still have planets, but there are a few. And there may be about 100,000 in our galaxy, and similar numbers in similar galaxies, presumably throughout the universe. So a little bit more about how they're formed. I alluded to the fact that a massive star explodes with a catastrophic bang, burst, towards the end of its life, the core of the star gets kicked against and gets compressed. So this has been one of the first and best supernovae explosions we saw. There's a star here picked out with an arrow. You don't need the arrow here. It's dramatically exploded. And just to be absolutely clear, the arrow's added after the photograph's taken. <laughs> This exploding star was observed by the Chinese in 1054 AD. For a long time, we weren't quite sure why it kept shining so well. We now know there's a pulsar in there, and that's what helps keep it shine. So in a little bit more detail for anybody who's a physics freak, these things have a mass of a few times 10 to the 27 tons. That's a few thousand, million, 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 million tons. So comparable broadly with the mass of our sun. But they're a little ball with a radius of only 10 kilometers. And I don't mean 10 to the power something, I mean 10 kilometers. So you could put one down in Toronto and we'd be fine here, for example. <laughs> you wouldn't want to put one down on Toronto, would you? Their average density is like the density of the nucleus of the atom. And we believe they're rich in neutrons, hence the name 
alternative name, neutron stars. The density is phenomenal, and to unpack that just a little bit, take a thimble, a sewing thimble, preferably a nice silver one. Take the population of the globe, seven billion people, jam them into the thimble, one by one. Teenagers love this. <laughs> and when the thimble is full with the seven billion people, or seven point something billion people, it has the same mass as if it were filled with material from one of these stars. They are really dense. And because they're dense, the gravity at the surface is very strong, there are tidal effects, and the physics of the inside is fantastic because they're very condensed matter, very solid state physics. The strong gravity bends light, so if I stand on the surface of one of these stars, I can see over the horizon, probably about 20 or 30 degrees, and without moving, I can see about two-thirds of the surface of the star because of the way light bends. The light will also redshift, sorry, the gravity will also redshift light. So if there were little green men on these stars, they'd look like little red men to us. And the gravity also affects clocks. Instead of doing a tick every second, it does a tick every two seconds. Um, if I went with the clock to one of these stars, I could take my pulse with it. It would seem perfectly normal. And that's because the gravity has also slowed my heart and my metabolism. It slows everything. There's also a very strong gradient of gravity. Suppose I'm coming in to land on one of these stars, and I'm coming in feet first, because that's the, the ladylike way to land on a star. <laughs> and as I get pulled down, the gravity's strong, but the gravity on my feet is perceptibly stronger than the gravity on my head, and it stretches my body long and thin. And actually, worse than that, it starts pulling the body apart. So don't <laughs> go visit. <laughs> There's also phenomenal magnetic fields, something like 100 million Tesla. To put that in context, your fridge magnet is about one hundredth of a Tesla. And if you spin a magnetic field, you get a huge voltage drop, probably about 10 billion volts per centimeter, which means strong though the gravity is, the electromagnetic forces are 100 billion times stronger. So don't take your credit cards when you go. <laughs> They're very good timekeepers. Once you get thousand, million, 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 million tons spinning, it's the devil's own job to make it change its spin, so it just keeps going round. And the typical pulsar is accurate to one part in a 10,000 million million which means the typical pulsar's period has increased by about one second since the age of the dinosaurs. These things are brilliant clocks. For a time, we thought they'd become the, the best clocks humanity knew. In fact, the US has been working on this since then, and they're no longer quite as good as some of the uh, best human clocks, timekeepers, but they're still very good. And we're using them um, as clocks dotted throughout the galaxy to test Einstein's theories of relativity. The field is going to get even more exciting. The Chinese are just opening a radio telescope that is half a kilometre across, 500 metres. It's in the south of China in limestone country. If any of you have seen the telescope in Puerto Rico, it's done in similar country, but of course, this is bigger, being Chinese. It's currently being commissioned. Uh, I know the uh, chief scientist. Um, he was telling me in August that they had about 70 new pulsars, and he said some very interesting, weird things, but wasn't, of course, going to say more about what those were. Nearer home in British Columbia is CHIME, Canada's new radio, newest radio telescope. This gives you a good overview, overview of the scenery. Closer up, there's four cylinders. And this type of radio telescope is good for pulsar work 
because it's got both good sensitivity, lots of area to collect the radio waves, but also good pointing, good beams. So this is just starting operation. Um, I haven't heard anything out of it yet about pulsars. Um, there's one or two other rumours coming out, but not yet on the pulsar front. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of wonderful stuff there. And I'm going to finish this rather crazy canter with some even crazier pulsar records. The centre of a neutron star, the pressure is large. The fastest known pulsar, currently the fastest known, is this one. This is the, the, the way we name them, PSR for pulsar. Their right ascension, which is like longitude, and their declination, which is like latitude on the sky. And this is its period in milliseconds, thousands of a second. And look at the accuracy. And that's three at the end. It's not all experimental uncertainty the period is actually increasing in the very last decimal place. Um, the audio recording probably won't work, but let's just try. Um, it's going so fast, it whines like your kitchen blender. It's doing about 700 revs per second. And it's an amazing thing. So it's quite staggering that a star can spin that fast and be stable enough that we can measure a period like this in milliseconds. You would not expect pulsars to have planets, but in fact they have discovered planets around one particular pulsar. Three planets, and now they think there's a little fourth one as well. The way they get these is, if I'm a pulsar and this is a planet, as the planet goes round the pulsar, it tugs the pulsar ever so slightly, and the pulsar moves around a little bit. And you can detect that Doppler shift due to the motion of the pulsar due to the planet. It gets more complicated when there's several planets, but with time you can disentangle it. The roundest known thing in the universe is the orbit of this particular pulsar. It's round to about five microns, which is smaller than the width of one of your hairs, and the orbit is about half a million kilometers. So that's round to incredible accuracy. Um, if you know anything of conics and eccentricity, that's the eccentricity, almost perfectly circular. And finally, if you go somewhere near a pulsar and let something fall onto the surface, it hits the deck traveling at half the speed of light. So strong is the gravity. I find these things truly amazing, and although I keep reciting these facts, I'm still not quite sure I believe it. <laughs> but I can assure you it is correct physics. The numbers are indeed right. Thank you for your interest. Let's, uh, let's have some questions. So there's a microphone there for those of us here in the theatre, and uh, the online questions are also flowing in. So let's start right here in the theatre. Thank you so much for your talk. That was yeah. really fun. Um, I was wondering, you know how uh, things in the sky, in the universe, they fall apart and we get det detritus coming mm -hmm. to the planet, and I wondered if a neutron star explodes, um, could it ever separate enough that we would see little pieces of it float to the planet? And if they did, would they maintain that density? And would there be any danger to them falling? And uh, have they discovered any remnants of a neutron star? 
The answer to most of your questions is no. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't seen yet an exploding neutron star. And I would think they're too far away for the detritus to hit us. But there is a related question. These stars are formed by big stars exploding, and it's the core of the big star. Are we in danger from one of these big stars exploding? The nearest big star to us that will explode one day is in the constellation of Orion. It's the one on top left, the reddish one, called Betelgeuse. One day, Betelgeuse will explode. <coughs> and as well as a sort of fireworks, there's risks from x-rays and things like that from produced in the explosion. It turns out that if there's an explosion within about 25 light years, we need to worry. Betelgeuse is 65 light years. So it's at a reasonably safe distance. And we don't know of any star closer than 25 light years that will explode. Some have in the past, but there aren't any left now within that distance. We'd undoubtedly see them if they did exist because they'd be so bright. So we think we're okay on that score. Let me quickly do an online question and we'll come back. Uh -huh. And I just hit the wrong button. So, hello from Greece. Can you give advice to young people who want to get involved in research? Is there some piece of advice you wish you had listened to when you were a student? Wow. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it is great fun being a research student, but it's several years hard slog. It is the normal way into research, but if people don't feel they can face that or can't fund that, then increasingly online, there are things that people can help with. This is called the Citizen Science Project. Uh, it started in Oxford. It started with a research student and his supervisor. The research student had the job of classifying a million galaxies. He had photographs of a million galaxies. And he had to say, that's a spiral, that's elliptical, da, 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 da. And he worked like the clappers for one week and did so many thousand. And then multiplied up and said, you're not going to do a million within a studentship. <laughs> so what they ended up doing was putting all those photographs on the web, providing a short tutorial. This is an elliptical galaxy. This is a spiral galaxy and inviting the public to do the classification. And the public piled in. And now increasingly you can find on the web, um, under the general heading of Zooniverse, so instead of Universe, it's Zooniverse, under the heading of Zooniverse, a lot of projects that desperately need human intervention. And incidentally, they're not all science ones either. So if anybody's interested in that kind of helping with research, your efforts would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. In the theater. Hi, so I'm an undergrad in physics and one of the big things that I wanna do in my master's is physics education research. As someone who's gone through, as a woman, minority, even just a physicist, what do you think are the next steps in the future to encourage more people to be in physics, not just women, but anyone in general? Um, we're in an English-speaking country. I come from an English-speaking country. The English-speaking countries have a problem that not all countries in the world have. Um, I'm extrapolating from astrophysics, but I think it's fair enough. Um, the English-speaking countries, Australia, US, Canada, UK, all lie below the world average in terms of the percentage of astronomers who are female. Um, Northern European countries like Germany and Netherlands are worse. Better than average are South and Central American countries and the Southern European Catholic countries like France, Spain, Italy. There's actually quite a range around the world um, in the percentage of women who are astronomers. And this says to me that there's nothing wrong with women's brains. That's not why we have relatively few people, women, in physics. It's not the brains. It's the local culture and the way society is organized. Women can do physics. Women do do physics and do it well. <laughs> so 
So we just need to convince the English-speaking world that, easy, you know, that that's the I'll situation. That. <laughs> Let's go inside the theater again. Hi, thank you so much again. Um, I was just curious about when you were talking about, like, you saw the pulses on, on the chart paper, but then why did they disappear for, like, yes. amounts of time and then come back? Thank you, and I didn't explain that. Um, the project started with what we called interplanetary scintillation, the twinkling of compact radio sources like quasars. What we inadvertently discovered, along with pulsars, was that there's another kind of scintillation produced in the space between the stars, interstellar scintillation, that also can brighten or fade a pulsar or anything else. But the time scale for that is not fractions of a second, it's weeks. And so these pulsars can disappear for weeks, but they can also be brighter than average for weeks. So you lose some and you win some. We'll take an online question. So this question, do you still enjoy stargazing? Or does doing astrophysics take some of the joy of looking up on a clear night sky? A clear night sky I find very, very impressive. The sad thing is that we've got more and more street lighting. And for those of us who live in urban areas, it's hard to see a good night sky. Um, typically in Britain, you cannot see the Milky Way from any city in the country. I would guess it's the same here, unless it's a very small city. You have to get out of the town, away from the lights. But if you get out into the countryside, it's magnificent. In the theatre. Speaking of looking at the sky, uh, you said that some of the pulsars were discovered in the visible wavelength range. Mm -hmm. How close would one have to be for us to actually see it blinking? There's a very, several very interesting stories, particularly concerning the pulsar in the Crab Nebula that I showed you. Um, there's a story way back from 1957 uh, from the McDonald Observatory in Texas. When McDonald gave money for that observatory, he specified that it had to be open to the public one night per month. And this story comes from a gentleman called Elliot Moore, who at that stage was a summer intern in the observatory, having just finished his bachelor's degree. And the telescope, it's a public observing night, the telescope is set on the Crab Nebula, and the rather curious star in the middle of the Crab Nebula that we now know is a pulsar going at 33, 30 times a second. And people stepped up to the telescope and said, cool and awesome, or whatever they said in 1957. <laughs> and a young woman steps up to the telescope and says, that star's flashing. Now, that pulsar is one that flashes in the optical. It's one of very few. She says, that star's flashing. The night assistant starts to explain to her about scintillation, the way you know, stars twinkle and planets don't. And she stops him. And she says, no, I hold an airplane pilot's license. For God's sake, this is 1957. It's a young woman. I hold an airplane pilot's license. My job is to fly newly built aircraft from the manufacturer to the customer. I fly at night. There's not much to do in the cockpit. I know about scintillation. That star's flashing. Now, it flashes at 30 times a second. But as some older Canadians may remember, the mains power supply here used to be at 30 hertz, 30 times a second. And some of you could see the lights and the television and things flashing. Some people can see 30 hertz. We suspect she saw it, but nobody followed up. <laughs> the excuse was there wasn't an appropriate bit of equipment. Elliot Moore thinks there was, and there was just an idleness. Always follow anomalies. So, yep, the occasional pulsar you can see flashing, but not many of them, because they're normally very weak. Thank you. One more question. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, I'm a fan of the Pioneer plaques. And yes. As you probably know, there's a pulsar map on there. Mm -hmm. uh, I was wondering if you had any comments on that. Uh, yes, so these, these are plaques that went on the two Voyager satellites, which have now got way beyond the sun and the planets and apparently still going strong. Um, 
there's some golden discs and there are these plaques um, showing some things about humanity. There's a man and a woman with no clothes on and that caused some consternation in the Midwest. <laughs> And there's in one corner of the plaque what looks like a sort of star pattern, lines coming out from a point. And the point is the Earth, and the lines indicate the directions of certain pulsars, and there are ticks on the lines that give the pulsar period. So if the aliens who pick up these satellites can decode all this, they can find where Earth is, and they can also find out when this stuff was sent off because the periods have aged a bit since then. Um, some people say it's dangerous to tell aliens where we are, <laughs> but we've been and gone and done it. Uh, and actually, ever since we've been broadcasting television and things, the radio waves have been traveling out through space. So there's not a lot we can do to retrieve the situation at this point. <laughs> But I was rather proud that they put pulsars on those plaques. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jocelyn Bell Burnell. Thank you very much.